as with many other outstanding figures in history, William Carey was an unlikely candidate for greatness. This very complicated man was born in 1761 in a Northamptonshire village. Family was very poor. As he said, they were unable to do very much for me. Had a scanty education which ended when he was 12 and in his mid-teens he became an apprentice shoemaker sharing an attic with the senior apprentice called John War. This guy invited him to the local congregational church where there was to be a special service. On the 10th of February, 1779, King George III had set it aside as a day of fasting and prayer. Interesting, isn't it? We have a national lottery. They had national days of fasting and prayer. Mr. Chater at the church preached about the reproach of following Christ. And that very day, the 17-year-old Carey was led to depend wholly on the crucified Savior for pardon and for salvation. He wrote, I felt ruined and helpless. I now had the desire to follow Christ. And at 20, this student of languages married an illiterate lady who was six years older than himself. Their poverty was awful. He had a sign by his cottage which said, secondhand shoes bought and sold. He got £10 a year for being the lay pastor of a rundown Baptist chapel at Moulton near Kettering. And then in 1789, the year the Napoleonic Wars broke out, he moved to Harvey Lane Church in Leicester. By now he had three sons, and the only way he could cope with his financial crisis was to move to this bigger church. By all accounts, it was a very troubled church with hyper-Calvinism. We have to remind ourselves that hyper-Calvinism is false Calvinism. Hyper-Calvinism is no Calvinism. Now, why be so dogmatic about it? Well, among other reasons, hyper-Calvinism denies that the gospel is to be offered to everybody freely and sincerely. Carey was a decided five-point Calvinist. So to get rid of that suffocating false teaching, he closed the Harvey Lane Church and reopened it without the hyper-Calvinists. He belonged to an association of churches, and at a meeting of them in Nottingham in 1792, he preached a history-making sermon in favor of foreign missions. Only his two headings have survived. One, expect great things from God to attempt great things for God. Also in 1792, the particular Baptist Society for Propagating the Gospel was started, and it was agreed that if they couldn't send their own missionary, they would support existing missionary enterprises. And the minutes mention the Moravians and the Presbyterians, by the way, those of you who are curious about the influence of the Moravians on Carey might like to read this evangelical library lecture about them. Anyway, this little Baptist society was not the first in the field by any standard, which really means that book copying book that Carey was the father of modern missions has to be questioned. He was the father of modern Baptist missions. And he was not truthfully more than that, even in his missionary methods. Now, it was admirable for Carey to offer to go to India, but it was not admirable that he proposed to leave his wife behind because she refused to go with him. And she had some reasons. She was five months pregnant. She already had three children, and she knew about the war with France. And his plans to go without her only fell through when his missionary companions, creditors, caught up with him and the ship left without them. Now, you've only been told that to warn you never to idolize any of these Christians from the past. 
They're only human beings like us. That enforced delay left time for Dorothy to have the baby and to be persuaded to make the five-month voyage to Calcutta. When they arrived in 1793, they immediately set out on what had been to him a mission which had been burning in his heart for many years. The thing that sent her into a depression and ultimately into a derangement was the death of her five-year-old Peter from dysentery a year after they landed. Dysentery also killed her in 1807, and five months later, he remarried. Carey believed that missions should be self-supporting. So for the first six years, he managed an indigo factory which gave him the equivalent of a work permit. And then in 1800, a Danish mission gave him and his helpers security in a base at Serampur. That's about 15 miles from Calcutta. Here the work started to prosper spiritually. In 1800, God gave them the first convert from Hinduism, Krishna Pal. 25 years later, he calculated there were 700 converts. Carey made the discovery that if he preached Christ crucified instead of denouncing Hinduism, he made better progress and there was more response. He turned Serampur into a linguistic center. He made translations of the whole Bible into six Indian languages. And he supervised part translations into 24 other languages. His capacity for concentrated work was enormous. But he was a team player. And he was greatly helped by a group of like-minded people. They're called the Serampur Brotherhood. And they're mostly modeled on the way the Moravians organized themselves. At that time, the brother of the great Duke of Wellington became the Governor General of British India. And he created Fort William College to train civil servants. Carey's gift with languages gained him a post there. He taught Bengali and Sanskrit, and he drew as a professor a salary of 1,800 pounds. That was an immense sum of money at that time. And he drew it for 30 years. That made him fully independent, not only of all Baptist churches, but also of their missionary society. It gave him status in British India. Carey now became one of the instruments in starting a college in Serampur, a Christian school for Indians. The King of Denmark even allowed it to confer degrees. So the man who had once been a poverty-stricken cobbler was now raised by the Lord to be a well-paid scholar. And in the midst of all this activity, there was a fire at Carey's Serampur headquarters. Everything was destroyed. The buildings, the books, the printing presses, even his precious manuscripts. He wrote, we ought to acquiesce in all that God does with us and to us. God has a sovereign right to dispose of us as he pleases. That fire of 1812 gave the Brotherhood a worldwide publicity. 10,000 pounds flooded in, and it was Carey who actually said, please stop sending donations. Everything was replaced, bar one thing, those precious manuscripts. He had to labor all over again and rewrite everything. Although Carey had made the change from poverty to wealth, he never forgot the primary reason why he had gone to India. Basically, he was a missionary, okay? He was part of a talented team that was convinced that scripture 
was central to world evangelism. And by the time of his death in 1834, he had been a missionary without a furlough for 40 years. He had his faculties to the very end. Among his last words were, I have no fears, I have no doubts, I have not a wish left unsatisfied. Age 72, he died insisting on a simple service and burial beside his second wife. And his words for his headstone were these, a wretched, poor, and helpless worm, on thy kind arms I fall. The Danish flag flew at half-mast, and heaven received a man who had served the Lord in ways that still leave us amazed at the wonderful works of Christ in the submissive and dedicated believer. Amen.